Well, good morning, friends. I greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and I welcome you to worship this morning. It's so nice to see faces again as we slowly creep back to, to normal, whatever that means in this new world that we live in. But it's wonderful for us to be able to gather together and worship God this morning. I want to welcome those who are connecting with us. I trust that you too will enjoy our time together as the family of God. So welcome. Let's open with a word of prayer. Let's pray. O oh Lord, as we gather this morning, we come in a, a spirit of celebration. A spirit of celebration because so much has changed and yet you still remain the same. Your love for us is still unconditional. You are still a merciful God. You are still one who draws us close to your own heart. You are still our Father. And so while there is much to consider, much to complain about, there is also much to celebrate. And so we come this morning to celebrate you. To say again, Lord, that we love you. That you are indeed our God. So thank you for this space that you have provided for us. Lord, we again want to say that if COVID-19 has taught us one thing, it is that we are not to take this time for granted. We have struggled without it. And so thank you for this time where we can connect with you and with each other. A time where we can be reminded again that we are part of a family, the family of God. That we are indeed part of a movement. A movement whose purpose is to extend the kingdom of God. Thank you for giving each of us a sense of meaning and purpose. We don't just exist, Lord. We are here because you have ordained it so. And so thank you that we are not alone. And as we continue in this time of worship, we ask you to, by your Spirit, Draw us into an encounter with you, Lord. For we know it is you who initiates the process. We cannot find you without you. And so allow us this moment to perhaps just let go of everything else so that we can allow you, Jesus, to be the center the center of all that we, that we do here. Thank you that we can celebrate your presence. And we do praise you, Lord, for the love and grace which we find in you, which we receive from you. And we acknowledge that it is that love and grace that we will ultimately be measured against. So thank you for, for being here, Lord, for waiting for us to draw close to you into this space that you have provided. Come and be amongst us, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I invite us to stand together and sing our first song, Here I Am Waiting, a song of, that allows us to open our hearts to God, saying to God, here we are, Lord. We've responded to your call to come to worship, and we want to hear from you this morning. So let's stand and sing together, Here I Am Waiting. when we sing that sincerely, God responds, and he comes to us, and abides with us. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for receiving us just as we are. We don't need to be worthy to come. In fact, we know we're not worthy. There are all kinds of things that we struggle with. Not only in our, in our own faith, but also as we try and live out that faith. We acknowledge that there are things that we do, Lord, that, yeah, that we are not proud of. Things that when we look back, we know 
ha- has disappointed you. But thank you that you give us an opportunity to confess those things. To not try and hide them, but to bring them to you and to openly acknowledge that we have made a mistake, that we have let you down, that we have hurt others. And sometimes even, Lord, we have hurt ourselves. So thank you that as we bring those things to you, so you hear us. And as we share them, so you confirm that you are a God who is merciful. You help us to know that we are forgiven. And that, in a real sense, the slate is wiped clean. And you give us another chance. So as we reflect, Lord, we we acknowledge that we so easily forget your love. And in forgetting, we feel alone. We feel disconnected from you, from everything. Please help us. Lord, we so easily discard your love as an option. And in our discarding, oh Lord, how much pain we cause. How much violence is done. What poverty and injustice results. Forgive us. We so easily Lord, also deny love's power. And in our denying how corrupt we become, how addicted to power and wealth and applause, how quick to justify our greed, consumption and expediency. Oh Lord, forgive us Forgive us for allowing other things to come before your love. Forgive us for the brokenness we have brought on ourselves and our world. Oh Lord, teach us. Teach us to love as you do. Wholeheartedly. Vulnerably. Openly. Unconditionally. And use us to nurture and expand the influence of your love in a world that desperately needs it. Friends, I want to invite you into a moment of quiet prayer. I invite you to reflect on your own life and to bring your own confessions before God. Friends, hear the good news. When we come before God in humility and honesty, God draws near to us with forgiveness and renewed blessing. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I'm going to invite Alvin to share our scripture with us this morning as we continue our journey with James. We'll be looking, we'll continue in James chapter 2. Thank you, Alvin. Sorry, I'm reading from James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. Faith and good deeds. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abram considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abram believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. May God open our ears to hear his word. Thank you, Alvin. Let us pray. Indeed, Lord, we ask you to, to bring understanding as we spend a moment just sitting at your feet and listening what you have to say. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think James's <clears throat> letter is particularly challenging. And this passage that we read is a real is a real challenge to us as those who follow Jesus. I think today we look at probably or arguably the most misunderstood section of James's entire letter, a section in which James addresses false Christianity. Or one can even take it a bit further. James addresses a false church. Now, some have 
argue that this passage stands in contradiction to Paul's teaching concerning the way of salvation. We remember Paul saying in his letter that he wrote to the church in Ephesus, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. But here, James says, Fool, when will you ever learn that faith that does, that does not result in good works is useless? What is, is there a contradiction here? I think if we properly understand what Paul and James is speaking about, we will see that there is in fact no conflict. And so as we unpack this passage, there are a number of things that we must keep in mind. The situations presented by James were entirely different to those presented by Paul. Paul had in mind those who denied the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. He was speaking to those who believed that it was their good works that could save them. We must understand that in Paul's time there was a group of Jewish believers who believed and who were teaching that in order to become a Christian you need to be a Jew. You need to submit yourself to the Jewish law. And it was this group that Paul had a really hard time with. He was constantly in conflict with them saying that what you are teaching is false. Paul was, when he said, salvation is by grace through faith, talking to this group who believed that you can be saved through what you do. Whereas James was saying that true faith always expresses itself in good works. Paul was speaking about the way of salvation, and James was speaking about the life of a person who is saved. In other words, good works is evidence of salvation. Now, although Paul and James use the same words, they attach different meanings. As I've said, when Paul speaks of works, he means works of the Jewish law. Works like ceremonies and rituals and all that stuff that they had added to it. That they believed that if, you, that if you followed all these rules and regulations, you could consider yourself saved. When James speaks of works, he means works of love. What John Wesley referred to as works of mercy. Works that prove that faith is alive and real. James' intention was not to contrast two opposing methods of salvation. His intention was to show two kinds of faith. One genuine and the other false. Or as he put it, one alive and the other dead. So, when we unpack this passage, we keep these things in mind. So let's look at what he says. First, he says that true faith produces. Dear brothers and sisters, what's the use of saying you have faith if you don't prove it by your actions? That kind of faith can't save anyone. Strong words. And he goes on to give a practical example of, of helping those in need. He wanted to show that just having an intellectual faith or saying that we accept Christ do not mean much unless they are proved by the fruits of faith at work. He's warning here about a deceptive faith, a faith Someone once described this way. I was naked, and you questioned my lack of modesty in my appearance. 
I was imprisoned. And you debated the legal aspects of interference. I was penniless. And you discussed your tax-deductible donations from your wealth. I was sick. And you thanked the Lord for the blessings of your health. I was hungry. And you formed a club to study malnutrition. I was homeless. And you said God's love was shelter under any condition. I was lonely. And you left me by myself while you and your friends prayed. You seem so holy and close to God. Yet I'm still sick and alone and afraid. Notice that James did not write, if you have faith. Instead he wrote, if you say you have faith. Those with a deceptive faith often substitute words for works. John Bunyan, in uh, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, and if you haven't read Pilgrim's Progress, I would encourage you to get a copy and read it. In, 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 in Pilgrim's Progress, he speaks of a, a character named Talkative. And he said of that character, Religion has no place in his heart or house or conduct. All he has lies in his tongue. And his religion is just something to make a noise with. I think James is speaking of those who say all the right things. They may even pray beautifully. Speak about their faith very eloquently, using all the right theological terms, even quoting all the correct Bible verses. But their faith never shows itself in practical works. A faith that may have all the best intentions, but never translates any into action. A convenient faith that never costs anything. And James asks, can this kind of faith save anyone? And he answers with a resounding no. You see, a genuine faith is not about the knowledge we have gained, or the number of committees we have served on, or the fortune we have gathered, but rather on the help we have given. The help we have given our neighbor, instead of just passing them by on the other side. James warns you about the danger of a deceptive faith. The danger, because it's a counterfeit faith that can deceive a person into a false confidence of eternal life. James's theme in this passage is that true faith is alive. And the principle is that true faith dwells in the deepest recesses of the heart and only God can really see it. But, if there is faith deep in the heart, it cannot but manifest itself in outward expression. In other words, true faith always finds practical expression. You cannot keep true faith down. A 17th century Scottish preacher used to say, this is for you, Bill, was it you? Oh, okay. <laughs> Bill says, faith and works are the two feet with which a person walks in Christ. Faith and works are the two feet 
with which a person walks in Christ, one without the other, produces a spiritual cripple. James is so serious about this that he takes it even further. He tries to shock these readers out of their complacency. He speaks of a demonic faith. He says that even demons have faith. They believe in God and they shudder. You see, a deceptive faith can merely be an intellectual faith but it can also merely be an emotional faith. Like the demons, one can have a faith that consists of being enlightened in the mind and even stirred in the heart, but still be lost forever. Belief and emotional experience, James says, is not enough. They don't go far enough. James says, if this is all your faith consists of, then it is dead. At best, all you will be is a consumer. Christian consumers have no commitment beyond their own needs. They see the church as a place where they can get spiritual goods. And if they don't get what they need at one church, they go to another, never contributing anywhere. It's been stated that the new religion today is consumerism. This providing for our own, our own needs. Just being those who consume stuff and never adding to the benefit of society or humanity in any way. And that's the culture we live in, isn't it? We live in a consumerist culture. If you don't get what you want at one place, you just simply go to another place and look for it there. If what you want is no longer at one place, well, you just stop going there or using it. And, and, and sometimes that culture is drawn within our faith. If I don't get what I want here, yeah, I just simply go somewhere else. And your faith is reduced to getting, consuming. And you grow fatter and fatter and fatter. Like I feel when I watch sport. <laughs> My couch has had a hard time in this lockdown. <laughs> But you get the point. Consumerism. God doesn't call us to just be consumers. He wants us to be contributors too. James then goes on to explain that true faith is not only intellectual and emotional, it is also obedient. We must understand <coughs> that to the Hebrew mind, to worship is to obey. To worship is to obey. I think through the ages we've kind of watered down the word worship. Sometimes worship is simply what we're doing now. When we gather for an hour or so on a Sunday. That's worship. Sometimes we dilute it even further. We reduce it to the songs that we sing. 
Now, when we're singing, that's worship. We're worshiping. But to the Hebrew mind, that was not what worship was about. Worship was not just something that you did occasionally. To the Hebrew mind, worship was your life. Worship was how you obeyed. How you obeyed God. That was worship. And here James uses the examples of Abraham and Rahab to illustrate this. But again, this needs a little bit of explanation. James was not suggesting that Abraham's justification or acquittal before God depended on his works to the exclusion of faith. Abraham's faith resulted in his justification because it was the kind of faith that moved his heart and regulated his life. It was a faith that didn't just lie dormant. It expressed itself in active obedience. I've said it before. And let me say it again. Faith is not believing in spite of evidence. It's obeying in spite of consequence. Abram obeyed despite the possibility of the consequence of losing his son by his own hand. Rahab, although she was very far from Abraham, <laughs> Rahim exhibited the same kind of faith when she, when she protected the spies that were sent. And it says that, that that was credited to her as righteous, as righteousness. To sum up then, real faith involves the whole person. It involves the mind as the truth is received and understood. It involves the emotion, the heart, as it responds to and desires more of this truth. But it also involves the will, as the desired and received truth is acted upon in obedience, in obedience to God. And it was not just James who said this. Jesus was very, very strong on this. In Matthew 7, verse 17, is that frightening verse where Jesus says, Not everyone who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom of God, but only those who obey the will of my Father. The story he tells of the sheep and the goats, the criteria for, for dividing them, the criteria is service, isn't it? It's helping the needy. Jesus didn't just have compassion on the crowds. He healed them. He fed them. Jesus fought injustice wherever he found it was not just a belief system for Jesus. It was more than that. It was his life. And that's what he, he wants from those who follow him. Saving faith then is a faith that results in good works. It is a faith that Jesus is looking for amongst his followers. And this morning, we are called to examine our lives to make sure that we are not perhaps deceived into practice, practicing a faith that doesn't really save. Is our faith merely lived out in our head, an intellectual faith? Is our faith governed primarily by what we feel, an emotional faith, 
Or is our faith alive? Like that of Abraham and Rahab. Let's take up the challenge laid down by Paul when he said, look closely at yourselves. Look closely. Test yourselves to see if you are living in the faith. I think it's an examination that is well worth the time since a fruitless faith brings no glory to God and yields no benefit even to the one who has it. James ends this section by saying that the union between faith and works is as close as the union between body and soul. And Paul agrees. Just after he says that salvation is by grace through faith, he says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ so that we can do the good works he planned for us long ago. Shall we pray? Lord, we love your work. And we offer ourselves anew to have a faith that is filled with action. To have a love that strives to give the best in service to others. O oh Lord, we continue to pray that that our hearts may be opened so that the world may know we are yours through the good works we do. We know, Lord, that it is by what we do that we bring glory to you. So this morning, we, as we examine our own faith, we commit ourselves to serve others in the name of of Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, we sing our next song, Into Your Hands, as it is a song of commitment. We offer ourselves completely to God. While we sing that song, I invite you to bring your offerings to God's work in our community. Simply place your offering in the basket and return to your seat and remain standing as we finish the song. Into Your Hands. I commit again.
Dear Lord, we bring our tithes and offerings to you this morning and dedicate it to your use. Please, please bless those who have, who have brought their offerings, Lord, and, and bless the offerings and use both to extend your kingdom in our community. We acknowledge, Lord, that there is a world that desperately needs to not only hear of your love, but to see it. So help us. Help us to be your hands, your feet, in our community. So that more and more people may glorify you. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, just two notices I, I want to share with you this morning. First, to say that um, there is a course called Living with Loss that is available on our, our website. We know that there are many, uh, particularly at this time, who are struggling to to understand and come to terms with loss. Many have lost a lot, and they are struggling. And so we have made this course available um, on our website. So if you know of somebody who's perhaps going through such a time, just say to them, you know, they, they can go to our website, and there are a number of videos that explain the process and try and help someone journey through it. Um, there is also opportunity for them to connect with us if they um, should choose to do so. And I want to just take this opportunity to thank those who have made this course available. Pat and, and the team have put it together um, and it's now available on our website. So please make use of it uh, and pass the word around. Um, to those who perhaps need help in coping with loss at this time. You may have also seen the advertisement around the centenary shirts and cups that we have, um, that we have made available. If you would like to order any, please place your orders at the, at the church office. Um, we are celebrating our centenary next month. Um, uh, and we'll give you more information towards the end of September regarding that. We really do want to invite you to be a part of it as we celebrate 100 years in this community, 100 years of God's presence uh, and God's blessing. Those are just the two things that I want to share with you this morning. Before we close off our time together, I'm going to invite Eunice to lead us in our prayers of intercession this morning. Um, praying for others is one of, one of the ways that we can serve them. Um, and so we do believe that it is important uh, to pray for others. I'm going to invite Eunice to lead us in our prayers. Thank you. Wonderful to see all these faces. Really, really gorgeous. Um, shall we bow our heads in prayer, please? Loving Father, we bring before you the present situation with the churches in our country. Many are battling to keep open. Many ministers are not getting their stipends. Some only a portion. Father, you see all things. You know exactly what is going on. And you will be faithful and step in to rescue, deliver, and save them. Thank you, Lord. We cry out to you for rain in our catchment areas, Lord. Many cities and towns are desperate. Please hear our prayers. We pray for our young people writing exams, especially our matrix. Please grant them your presence in their lives. 
as they've had really a topsy-turvy year and a half. Please give them light at the end of the tunnel. We pray that they come out of this with a sound mind and well-rounded being, Lord. We pray for peace during our cur current registration and voting in our next elections. Grant Cyril Ramaphosa the wisdom and may he act on any wrongdoings. Please, Lord, prick his conscience. We pray for peace in Afghanistan and that you blind the Taliban from the oppression of your followers and also the oppression of women and girls. Please may the education carry on, Lord. Only you can do this. Lord, you are so good to us, full of unfailing love for us and ready to forgive all those that ask for help. Thank you, Lord. We pray for those with COVID, those suffering with brain fog and the side effects, those that are lo lost loved ones, Lord. Please bring them close to you. Loving Lord, thank you for your infinite love that truly surpasses all understanding. Help us to feel this love that is the same yesterday, today, and through to eternity. We pray for those that are sick, in hospitals, suffering, and those grieving. Lord, we pray for those that have hurt themselves. We pray for Ray Mandy's back. Lay your healing hand on him. And we pray for Mark Christie, for his leg, Lord. May he recover speedily with your love and your healing hand. We also pray for Nelly's brother-in-law, Steve. Lord, be with him and his family. Give them hope, Lord, and surround them with love. We also pray for the depressed. We must realize that you breathed life into us. A life we should choose to follow you. In a life that pleases you. Knowing that you made us in all that is precious in his sight. Try not to be anxious in anything, but in every situation, by praise and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. We pray for those that have lost their jobs and are battling to make ends meet. The hungry, we must remember and thank you for creating all humankind in your image. Forgive us when we fail to love others the way you love us. We pray for those with cancer, Lord. May we find you in all situations and give us faith and hope and healing, knowing your love is with us. We pray for your healing. We pray for your healing. We pray for the senior citizens, Lord, who have really struggled through, through this pandemic. Let them place their eyes on you, and Lord, and find peace and love. May you comfort us in our troubles so we can comfort others. Last but not least, we pray for Andrew, Lord, in leading us as a church family to find the vision that you, Lord, have set out for us. You know we want to do the right things in your eyes, and we thank you, Lord. Our God will meet all our needs according to his riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. He is our provider and the one who knows exactly what we need. 
So we need to fix our eyes on him in hope and assurance. Thank you, Lord, for healing, for hearing and healing us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Lenise, for leading us in our prayers of intercession. Isn't that an interesting statement, brain fog? <laughs> it's better to say to someone, I see you suffering from brain fog, <laughs> rather than calling them an idiot. <laughs> Thanks, Lenise. <laughs> right, friends, we've come to the end of our time together this morning encourage you to remember that worship is not just what we do here, but it goes with us as we live out our lives as those who follow Jesus. Let's end our time together by singing our last song, Hope and Glory, which is again a song that, in which we acknowledge that it is Christ alone that can help us with the issues that we face. Let's stand and sing together, Hope and Glory. that we stand in Christ and so receive the blessing. Go now and celebrate wherever God's name is honored. When suffering comes, pray in faith. In times of joy, sing songs of praise. Persevere in prayer and action to bring the fallen back to truth. And may, and may God save you from all that would harm you 
May Christ Jesus heal you and raise you up. And may the Holy Spirit anoint you and give you peace with one another. Amen. We close by singing together now unto him. Thank you.